We are your children and we've gathered here today. We've gathered here to pray. Hear our cry. Lord, we need your mercy and we need your grace today. Hear us as we pray. Oh, our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we thank you for the great privilege to be called your children. We thank you for the grace you have given us to call you Father, to call you Abba Father. Father, accept our worship, accept our praise, in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 
God bless you, choir. God bless you. Everybody, God bless you. Our Father in heaven will bless you and keep you. Wherever you are joining us, we say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we come to part six of our series on Let's Get It Right. The title of today's session is The Lord's Prayer. Last week, we saw from Luke chapter 11 verse 1, where the disciples requested Jesus to teach them how to pray. Let us turn our Bibles back to Luke 11, verses 2 to 4, to see how Jesus answered this request from his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He goes on and on. The Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray by giving a model prayer. This prayer has become very well known to us as the Lord's Prayer. The prayer is found in two places in the Bible, here in Luke 11 and also in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 5 to 13. Now, this prayer is only meant to be a pattern for praying. It is not meant for us to just memorize it and to be repeating it every time we want to pray. I know that many children and even many young Christians, they do this whenever they want to pray, whether before they leave their homes in the morning or whenever they have a need to pray. They will just quickly say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy, 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 thy. give us this day. That is all the prayer they know. We are not meant to just memorize and be repeating it as our prayers. The, the Lord Jesus Christ himself did not always use the same prayer. He prayed different prayers at different times. So what we call the Lord's Prayer is actually a guide or a teaching model which shows us the basic elements that should be included in our prayers. Now, there are many things we can learn from this model called the Lord's Prayer. The first one we learn is that the Lord Jesus Christ encourages us to pray more in private than in, in public. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, the Lord Jesus Christ said that we should not be like hypocrites who do not pray in private, but they are always praying in public so that people will see them. In verse 6, Jesus advised that we should go into a private place. We should shut the door and we should pray privately to our Father who art in heaven. Let us say very quickly that there is nothing wrong with praying publicly. After all, we pray publicly in church. The Lord Jesus Christ too prayed publicly in many places. But what the Lord Jesus was pointing out to us here was that hypocrites only pray in public, primarily for people to see them and to respect them, that they are prayerful, that they are close to God, that they are holy people. Rather, the first reason why God wants us to pray is not for people to see that we are praying. The first and primary reason why God wants us to pray and why Jesus is teaching us is for us to fellowship with God for us to spend time with God. And this fellowship is richer and more personal when we are praying privately ourselves. So this is an opportunity, a reminder, that as children of God, we should spend more time privately praying alone with God. 
The second lesson we learn from the Lord's Prayer is that God doesn't want our prayers just to concentrate on ourselves, ourselves, and our needs alone. From the way the Lord's Prayer begins, it says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This teaches us that prayers must always be focused on God rather than being focused on just ourselves. It is God that we are seeking when we are praying. The purposes of God must be our primary concern even when we are praying. The exaltation of God must be our aim when we pray. His glory must be our aspiration. And so, our first thought in prayer should be nothing else but God himself. That is why Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. For many children of God, any time we say we want to pray, we always approach God's throne with our shopping list or wish list. This is contrary to what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us here. Jesus wants us to start our prayers always with adoration, with praise, and with thanksgivings to the Lord God Almighty. That is why Psalm 100 verse 4 tells us to enter his gates with thanksgivings and to come into his courts with praise, to be thankful unto him and to bless his name. That is how God wants us to start our prayers when we, as his children, when we come into his presence. Unfortunately, however, Many of us merely pray like this. We just say, dear God, I want you to grant me a good day. I want traveling mercies. I want good relationships with everyone. I want favor. I want your blessings. When it's night, I want to sleep and I want to wake up tomorrow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. No worship, no praise, no adoration, no appreciation of what God is. Now, my brothers, my sisters, is that the way you pray? If your prayers tend to be like that all the time that you pray, then there is something that we are not doing right with our prayers. If this is the only way you know how to pray to God all the time, it means your theology is egocentric. That is, it is centered on yourself rather than being theocentric. That is, God-centered. We should have a God-centered or theocentric theology. We should see God as the center of all things. And if we have this correct understanding of how God wants us to pray to him, it will be reflected in the way that we pray. God will become more important to us than our own needs or our own petitions. And our prayers will begin and end by focusing on God majorly. Please let us remember this all the time. God must be sought always for no other reason than the fact that he is God. He is worthy of our highest regard, is worthy of our worship and our reverence. And so, when we pray, we ought to be seeking God, the giver, rather than the things that he gives. Whether he eventually gives us or blesses us or not, this is merely secondary and this is not the most important aspect of why we are praying. What really matters most to us is that we are serving God, that we are worshiping him, that we are seeking to please him, not what he gives us. Let us seek the Lord primarily because he is God. 
then our prayers, if we have this understanding, will be God-centered and not self-centered. And the truth of the matter is that God delights more in the prayer of his children when they start their prayers by appreciating and worshiping him rather than just coming with only personal prayer requests. It is common, for example, for matured Christians that when they want to pray, they first take a song or two or many more of worship, songs of adoration. It takes them into the presence of God. It adores God. It honors God. It pleases God. And it lifts our spirit. Because the Bible says that in his presence, you know, when we are in his presence, there is pleasure forevermore. It's glorious when you start to pray by worshiping God. One example of a person who sought the Lord with very pure motives, not for what he wants to get, in the Old Testament is that patriarch called Job. As we all know, Job was severely tested because Satan wanted to prove that Job was seeking God purely for selfish reasons. Satan told God that as long as God was blessing Job, Job will continue to be devoted to God. And that if God should stop blessing him, if God should deny him of any of the things he enjoys, like his children, like his money, like his health, Satan felt that Job would deny God. Unfortunately for Satan and to the glory of God, Job continued to worship God, even when he lost his health, when he lost his children, when he lost all his riches. And that is why in Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job 13, 15, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, here is a very searching question to ask ourselves. And let us try to be honest in our answer. If the Lord does not bless you, if the Lord does not provide for your needs when you are expecting it, if the Lord does not grant you your prayer requests, or he does not help you in times of trials, will you still trust him? Will you still seek him in prayer? Will you still honor him? Will you still praise him? Or will you stop praying because you think that your prayers are unprofitable, or that they are an unproductive effort? What if you prayed for relief from your burdens, but instead of these getting lighter, the burdens get even heavier? What if you prayed for peace, like we have been praying in Nigeria, and we are receiving more trouble? The peace does not seem to have come yet. Will we still continue to praise God? Will we still continue to worship him? In our prayers, if our prayer life tends to slacken whenever our prayers are seemingly not answered, or if we are disappointed when we don't have quick answers to our prayers, if we are doubting God, this could be an indication that we have been seeking God only for what he will give us, that we are not seeking God for who he is. Please let's be completely honest with ourselves, even in this important matter. What is your real motive for praying? Perhaps you need to ask the Lord to help you to seek him for who he is in prayers. And that is why the first petition in the Lord's Prayer, the model given to us by the Lord Jesus, is hallowed be your name. And as we go on with the Lord's Prayer, we come now to the second and the third petitions. And we notice 
that these ones too have absolutely nothing to do with us. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven as it is done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This teaches us the next thing that we need to observe about how to pray to God using the template of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is that our prayers must always be submitted to God's will and not to our own will or desires. Not only must our prayers begin with God as the object, our prayers must also have the will of God as the chief concern. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 tells us that this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask him anything according to his will, he heareth us. We will be very mistaken to think that prayer is all about asking the Lord to do what we wish according to our own will. Here in the Lord's Prayer, the petition, Thy will be done, comes at the head of all the petitions we make for ourselves. This means that for every request that comes after it, it is implied that your will be done in giving us our daily bread. Your will be done in forgiving our sins. Your will be done in leading, in leading us not into temptation. If we are to listen to the prayers that are being said by many children of God, we will not find submission to the will of God. Very often, people actually pray in effect that not your will, but my own will be done. Instead of saying, not my will, but God's will. Many children of God impose their wills upon God. Meanwhile, the Bible is firmly against this practice of imposing our selfish wills on God when we pray. That's why James chapter 4 verse 3 says, That ye ask, and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. If we listen to the prayers of many people, we see that clearly, they believe and act as if God is in heaven primarily to be used to make our dreams and our wishes come true, just like a fairy godmother or like Santa Claus, the Father Christmas. The truth is, how can we, who are mere creatures made by God, dictate to God what he should do? How can we who are sinners, who are saved by grace, issue orders to God and make him appear as if he's our waiter or is our office boy? It is absurd that we should pray without submission to God's will. Let's take great care not to be found guilty of this selfish attitude in prayer. Yes, Jeremiah 29 verse 11 assures us that God's thoughts towards us are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give us an expected end. Jesus too assures us that God knows our needs, he knows our wants, he knows our thoughts, but he will only grant our prayer requests not according to our thoughts or wishes, but according to his will. Therefore, as we saw Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, let our prayers always be with the condition that not my will, but your will be done, O God. We cannot say to God, if you don't answer my prayer requests, I will not worship you or I will not serve you anymore. Now, after expressing the attitude that it is the will of God that should prevail, we can then proceed to make our personal requests. We saw this as the next thing that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, when he said, Give us this day 
our daily bread. This symbolizes the opportunity God gives us to express our personal desires to God. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, We are able to cast our burdens upon the Lord, and that he shall sustain us. While Matthew 11:28 tells us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, someone sent me a question last week. That why did Jesus say that we should ask only for our daily bread? That why not ask for the bread for the week or for the year or even for our whole lifetime? Well, I would like to give two reasons why I believe this is what Jesus said. The first one is that the Lord's Prayer is just a template or a guide. We are able to ask for bread for as long as we desire, whether it is for the day or for a lifetime. After all, in Psalm 23 verse 6, the Bible tells us that God's goodness and mercies, they are able to follow us all the days of our lives, not just for one day. And then we are able to dwell in the Lord's house forever, not just for one day. The second reason, in my opinion, is that the number one reason for prayer is to build our relationship with God and our dependence on him. Therefore, Jesus Christ is teaching us that though God can give us bread for the week or for the year of our lives or enough for a lifetime, he nevertheless, he wants to be seeing us. He wants us to be coming to him. He wants us to be relying on him. That's why David said in Psalm 55, verses 16 to 17, that as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, will I pray and cry aloud, and the Lord shall hear my voice. And that's why First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, it tells us that we should pray without ceasing, that we should trust him all the time. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says we are to come boldly to his throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy, so that we can obtain grace and we can obtain help. Prayer is a high privilege that God grants to every believer. Where the great sovereign God of the universe condescends to listen and to consider our desires. Like salvation, this privilege comes to us by God's grace alone. Let's now consider the next petitions found in the Lord's Prayer. It says, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. We shall notice that the Lord Jesus Christ took time to emphasize the importance to God and to us also of forgiving others. Let us see the additional explanation that the Lord Jesus Christ gave in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, immediately after teaching his disciples the Lord's Prayer. He said, For if we forgive men their trespasses, our Father in heaven will also forgive us. But if we do not forgive people their trespasses, neither will God forgive us our own trespasses. And to show the seriousness of this matter of forgiveness and to allow Jesus the opportunity to teach us more on this point. God led Peter to ask Jesus in Matthew 18 that how many times should we forgive those that have offended us? Please read Matthew 18 verses 21 to verse 35. But because of time, I'll just read just verse 35 alone. Verse 35 says, So likewise shall our heavenly Father do also unto us, if we from our hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. After this major issue of forgiveness, Jesus Christ 
treated next the issue of temptation and deliverance from evil. He said, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The tone in each of these petitions is more of pleading, begging, and asking. The verbs give, forgive, lead us not, deliver in these prayers, they are not demands. They are pleas to God for his mercy, for his grace alone. We all know, those of us who are parents, that we teach our children to say please in order to teach them the proper attitude when they want to request things from not just we, their parents, but even others that are older than they are. And if a child comes to you and makes a demand without adding please, we say they are rude and we tell them, say please. The same way, we shouldn't just go to God and be demanding things as if he's our houseboy. We should come with a lowly heart. We should come asking him by his grace, asking him by his mercy. If we break down the Lord's Prayer, there are about 14 sentences there altogether. Out of these 14 sentences, only four of them are our personal requests. This one center on our requests, the personal needs, forgiveness of sins, and also deliverance from temptation and from evil. It shows us that it's only about 25% of our prayers that should just be, I want this, I want this, I want that. The remaining 75% ideally should be to worship God, to thank God, to pray for his will, to intercede for others, and to appreciate him. That is the model that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. And it is my hope that all of us will be careful from now on about how we pray. Let us not just be presumptuous. Let us start our prayers with worship, with thanksgivings, with appreciation and adoration. Secondly, let's continue to pray for the will of God. That is his own de de requests, his own desires. We must be praying the desires of God before we pray our own desires. Thirdly, our privilege as God's children is to make our petitions to him as often as we desire. And then we should never forget to be asking for forgiveness of our sins. Because the Bible says, if I had iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So it is good practice that when you are praying, especially alone, that you ask God to forgive you of your sins. May the Lord help each one of us to treasure the great privilege that we have of being granted an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is what the Lord's Prayer is all about. God bless you and God keep you. God will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. We shall see you again same time next week. Bye-bye. God bless you. Thanks for watching today's episode of our special Digging Deep. For questioning on any of our Bible study topics, kindly send a message to 80 9975 WhatsApp only, or send a mail to rccgtempleofgodparish at gmail.com. <laughs>